Amen. So keep your place there in Leviticus chapter 20. Um, we're going to get there in a minute. But let me just say this about Leviticus chapter 20. You, know, you probably don't hear this uh, chapter read in too many uh, churches today, I wouldn't think. Um, Leviticus chapter 20. But the point is, um, let me just say this before we even begin the sermon um, this morning. I love Leviticus chapter 20 as much as I love Leviticus chapter 21 or John chapter 5 or John chapter 2 or any other verse or part of the Bible. It's just as true as every part of the Bible, whether people want to read it today or not. Now, Leviticus chapter 20 is a chapter covering um, many of the, the civil laws in the nation of Israel. It's, it's kind of showing us what God's morality is in the Bible. But let me just say this, Leviticus chapter 20, and that's going to, what we're going to talk about this morning. Leviticus chapter 20 and many other um, places in Leviticus shows us that the, the book of Leviticus is a book of consequences. We're talking about in Leviticus chapter 20 specifically, just these consequences. I mean, I always think when I read or when I hear Leviticus chapter 20 read or I read it myself, I always think to myself like, man, we're bad. God like, had to like make up these rules. You ever think about that? Like God like, had to like write this stuff down in the Bible. Because if you're a normal person and you're reading all these things, you're just, you're, you're, it's, just, it's disgusting to you. It's disgusting. You're, you're, God is literally having to list out in the law that things like, you know, perversions like incest and lying with the beast and homosexuality and all these, these things that we don't even like to think about are, you know, to be punished with capital punishment. God has to list that out. And I was like, man, it's so bad that God has to actually make rules for these things. Then it goes into things like adultery, even cursing your parents gets capital punishment in the Bible here. God has to list all these things out. But all that to say this, what I want to focus on this morning is that the Bible is a book of consequences. And I want to actually look at the first few verses of Leviticus chapter 20 because we see some very specific crimes and very specific perversions listed out later on in the chapter of Le Leviticus chapter 20. But what I want to point out is that the first part of the chapter, look at verse number one, we see something very specific because God, he puts a punishment not only on the person doing the crime, but somebody that would pretend that the crime was not happening. Look at verse number one of Leviticus chapter 20. And we'll see what God's standards are this morning. The Bible says in Leviticus 20 in verse number one, the Bible says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Again, thou shalt say to the children of Israel, Whosoever he be of the children of Israel, or of the strangers that sojourn in Israel, that giveth any of his seed unto Molech, he surely shall be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. Verse 3, And I will set my face against that man, and will cut him off from among his people, because he hath given of his seed unto Molech, to defile my sanctuary, and to profane my holy name. So what we're talking about here in verse number 2 and verse number 3 is people that were literally sacrificing their children to this false god. And this was commonplace amongst the nations where the children of Israel went into the promised land and, and went to war with all these nations. They were literally so wicked. Their, their evil was so full at that point that they were literally sacrificing their own children to false gods. And the Bible here is saying, I mean, verse number two and verse number three, I mean, that's understandable. You have people that are murdering their own children. And the Bible is saying, you know, those people should be put to death. Now look at verse number four. Now we see something different. Look at verse number four. It says, and if the people of the land do any ways hide, if the people of the land do any ways hide their eyes from the man, when he giveth of his seed unto Molech and kill him not, then will I set my face against that man. This is super important, and this is what we're going to talk about this morning. The Bible here is saying, yes, there's this wickedness going on in the land, but then God takes this standard further. and He says, oh, by the way, not only is that person to be punished for what he's done, but anybody that pretends that is not happening, literally hiding their face from that man, like just looking the other way, that man is guilty as well. And that's what I want to talk about this morning, that God teaches clearly in the Bible that it is not only the people doing the sin that are going to suffer, but also people that are pretending that it is not happening. God will hold them accountable too. That's what it means, hiding their eyes. 
they know what's happening. They know what's going on in their heart, but they just don't want to look. They don't want to see what's happening. We want to talk about people that no sin is happening, that don't do anything about it, that even go as far as to support it. This is how God looks at things. This is what he's talking about in Matthew 20, 30 that we talked about a few weeks ago where it says, if you gathereth not with me, you are scattering abroad. It's the same theory applied here. God is saying just hiding your eyes from sin is not good enough. Look, this isn't what you're taught today. This is not the philosophy that is taught in our world and even in these liberal churches today. Because we're taught today that, oh, we're, not to, pretend, we're to pretend that sin is, just doesn't matter. We're to pretend that uh, you know, people that are in sin, that, oh, God forbid you would say or rebuke or reprove anyone that has sin in their life. That is not what the Bible teaches. And that is what Leviticus chapter 20 is pointing out. This morning, the title of the sermon this morning is Enabling Sin. Enabling Sin. Hiding your eyes from sin. Turn to Proverbs chapter 22 or look at the front of your bulletin. It is the verse of the week. We're going to talk about enabling sin today. We're going to talk about hiding your eyes from sin that you know is going on or even supporting sin that you know is going on. Not in your life, but in the lives of people that you are associated with. The Bible teaches something very different than it's being taught today. The Bible teaches that, you know, we should not enable sin. We should not support sin in any way. Look at Proverbs chapter 22. Where does it begin? I want to show you where enabling sin begins with almost everybody in their lives. Look at Proverbs chapter 22 and look at verse number 15. Proverbs chapter 22 and verse number 15, the biggest areas that you will see people enable sin and the biggest areas that people will start enabling sin in their lives is with their own children. Look at Proverbs 22 and verse number 15. The Bible says this, it says, foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. You say, oh, that's a simple verse. No, it's not. That is super important. That is exactly opposite of what the world teaches today. The Bible does not say foolishness is um, going to be in the heart of a child. It doesn't say ch children will do foolish things. It says foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. It says it's already there. I don't care. I know you think your child is great and your child is the best looking and best behaved child in the world, but foolishness is in, bound in the heart of every child. You say, how is that possible? Why? Turn to Romans chapter 8. This should be the entire sermon right here, or at least half the sermon, because you need to understand as a parent, as a grandparent, as somebody that would be a parent one day, that foolishness will be bound in the heart of every child, even yours. Look at Romans chapter 8. Go to Romans chapter 8 and look at verse number 3. Romans chapter 8, look at verse number 3. The Bible says, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. I want you to just notice these two words that are used together here, sin and flesh. What the Bible here is saying is if you have flesh, which all of us do, you have that sin nature. That's what the Bible is saying. That's what Paul is talking about all throughout the book of Romans, is that just having that flesh, having this body... Look, I'm saved today. Hopefully, you're saved today. If you've trusted on the Lord Jesus Christ, you are saved. But if you still have a fleshly body, you still have a sin nature. That is the problem that we have. That is why foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. In Romans chapter 5, verse number 3, the Bible talks about how that sin nature comes from our father. Which, if we want to get into doctrine about this, who was Jesus' father? Jesus' father was not Joseph. It was God, the father. So Jesus was without sin, even though he had the flesh. It's just kind of a neat little connection there. But the point is, foolishness. Back to children. Back to children. You have this wonderful child, and he's super cute, and everybody loves him. But guess what? He is foolish. It's there. It is bound in him, meaning it is attached to him. It needs to be driven from him or her. You must unbind the foolishness. Doing nothing, you lose. 
Doing nothing, Satan wins. Because it's already bound. It's already there. And that's why the Bible talks about the rod of correction. <gasps> I don't want to spank my child. If you don't, you hate your child, the Bible says. Why? Because the foolishness is bound there. And it needs to be removed. So this is the first stage in people's lives where they enable sin. This needs to be half the sermon because the philosophy today, especially raising children, is let my child explore himself. Let my child find themselves. You know what they will find? They will find foolishness. And wicked, evil people will find them. There is an agenda behind this philosophy. There's an agenda that Satan is the driver of to just let your child explore themselves. Keep them foolish. That's what Satan wants. It wasn't hard for me to find um, some article on what I just said. You just go and like, you know, do anything, Google anything on raising children, and you will get this kind of garbage come up. I found, I just, I just like, how to raise children. I just Googled it, and I like picked like the first article that came up. And I actually stopped reading the article at some point because I'm like, this can't be real. This has got to be somebody making a joke just so I can make a sermon out of this. But I want to read, I mean, I'm going to read you this article. It was like the first, like, I don't know how to raise kids. What should I do? Let's go to Google. Let's use AI to raise our children. This is what, this is what AI will tell you right here. Here's, here's the first article I came across. Seven clever ways to help your child be themselves. When I read that, because I, I mean, if you know the Bible and you just read, you, just, you don't even have to read articles like this. You can, just, you can just read that and you're just like, seven ways to ruin your child, if you know what the Bible says. Seven ways to make sure the devil gets your child, is what you can just read that saying. But I'm going to read you a few of these, because it's, it's entertaining. But this is out there. This is the common philosophy today. This is the, the politically correct way to raise your children today. Remembering Proverbs 22, that foolishness is bound in their heart. When they're born and they, raise, they start walking around, and, and I mean, anyone who's raised children knows this, that foolishness is bound with them. Here's number one. I don't know. This is some parenting website. I don't even feel like it's necessary to, to list it. Here's number one. Give your child a space to call their own. Okay, well, I mean, you know what that means, so I'm just going to explain it to you. Here, here's the, this is the quote from the article. We're talking about seven clever ways to help your child be themselves. Seven clever ways to send your child to hell. No, I'm just kidding. I'll stop. Seven clever ways to help your child be themselves. I'm going to try to quote this article without being cynical. Give your child a space to call their own. There will be days when your amazing child comes home from school feeling well, less than amazing about themselves. First of all, you have to ask yourself, now this is me commenting. You have to ask yourself, why would my child come home from school feeling bad about themselves? Why would that happen? Are, are, is anyone, are the wheels turning with anyone that reads this type of stuff? Back to the quote. At these times, a safe, loving home environment offers them all the resources they'll need to process, recharge, and regroup. You see what this is doing? This is totally admitting that the public school system is unsafe and unloving. I mean, it's literally like you have to, the child has to come home after being destroyed all day long. They have to come home and recharge. Recharge, why? Because they're being torn down every day by an unloving, unsafe environment. Is anyone registering this as I, as I read this? And the answer is this. Now, I'm going to go back to the article. Establish their own space at home that is theirs alone. A bedroom, a desk, a cubby house, or even just a corner. So the answer as you, as you send your child to a public school system that will abuse them and tear them down is to bring them home and put them in the corner or lock, put them in a room by themselves. I mean, I mean, encourage them to be alone. Step number, I'm going to skip step number two. Skip, step number three is one of my favorites out of this article. Use a favorite TV show for reinforcement. Oh, I bet parents today love that one. Is there like, I can just set them in front of a TV. And that will raise them for me. You know what? People do this, though. Let me quote this. I'm going to quote this without being cynical, try to get through the whole thing. Sometimes, no matter how many times you say something to your child, 
Because it was said by you, they're not going to listen. Saying it's normal that your children wouldn't listen to you. So try this sneaky trick. Seek out a favorite age-appropriate DVD, you know, age-appropriate, meaning it's okay for adults to watch perverted things, but not children, which the Bible doesn't teach that, okay? If it's wrong for your children to see it, it's wrong for you to see it. That's what the Bible teaches. There is no, you know, situational ethics taught in the Bible. Anyway, back to the article. I'm having a hard time here. Seek out your favorite age-appropriate DVD with a character that experiences similar issues to your child and then sit back and let the characters do the work for you. Let TV raise your children. For example, in the popular kids' animation series Lego Ninjago, one of the team, Zane, the white ninja, first of all, I'm reading this, I'm like, this must be an old article. Is it even legal to have a white ninja today? I mean, that's, I mean, I'm just like, racist! The white ninja is different from the rest of the team. He is literally, he doesn't understand simple jokes. He seems to be bewildered. Whatever. For young children in early primary school who are struggling to fit in, the white ninja is a wonderful role model who brings his own special skills and personality to the group. Parents can use Lego Ninjago on DVD as a tool to help kids identify and understand their unique talents and personalities. At this point, I was checking the website to see if it's fake. I'm like, this is just made up for my sermon at this point. It's just, tra we're just training kids to be weird here at this point. Or encourage them to fit in. Like, these are all bad things. First of all, your kids should listen to you. If your kids aren't listening to you, that's a problem. Your kids should be listening to you. But instead, they're saying, if they don't listen to you, set them in front of the TV and let the TV raise your kids, which I don't know. I looked at this stat like a year ago when I did a sermon on TV, and it's like, I don't know, like I think the boomers have the record for like TV hours per day at like seven and a half or eight hours per day, but the average child is watching like six plus hours of TV every single day in the United States. The problem is, folks, though, when it comes to, you know, character reinforcement and all these things, if there is no anchor in your life, if there is no what is the right way and what is the wrong way, if there is no absolute truth, TV will raise your kids. Somebody else will raise your kids. Item number five, don't go into battle for them. This is, this is a really bad one. Don't go into battle for them. You know what this is subtly saying? Don't protect them. This is subtly saying, let them go out and experience things. It literally says this. When they're babies, kissing a child sore makes the hurt go away. As your child gets older and starts to navigate their way through challenging situations that threaten to dim their dazzle, your first instinct may be to jump in and make it all better. But as difficult as it may be to watch from the sidelines as they stumble or feel unhappy, it is imperative that you let them figure it out on their own. This is, Satan wrote this article right here. Let them figure it out on their own. You know what they're going to figure out? Foolishness. This is, a wolf is going to get them because they're foolish. It's bound in them. The, the, the article here is literally saying that you should, these are, the, these are the people, these are the people that tell you that when you homeschool and you remove your children from these, these wicked environments, that tear them down and attack their Christianity and ta attack their beliefs. These are the people that tell you, no, no, you need to let them go out and experience the world. Those are, those are wicked people that say that to you. They're saying that you should let your child go out and fall into sin, fall into the hands of evil people. Let them figure it out on their own. But how can they figure it out on their own when foolishness is bound within them? They will not figure it out on their own. Somebody will take them and figure it out for them. The, the, these people are trying to get parents to drop their guard and let TV raise your children. Let other people have access to your children. Let people tear your children down. Number seven, I'll just skip to number seven. Seek out, turn to Proverbs chapter 24 as we finish up this, this, uh, this quote here. Seek out further resources. Again, pointing you to outside resources for, you know, the raising of your own children. Despite your best efforts, and those of your child, sometimes their situation may require you to seek outside help. 
Calling in the experts actually works to increase your child's support network and reinforce your own efforts. It's talking about taking them to a psychologist here. So yeah, let's just go and take them to some secular psychologist that'll put them on a bunch of drugs and, and, and ruin their life that way. Uh, this is wicked stuff. Look, this should be your guide, folks, right here. This has to be your guide if you want to be successful. This article and this philosophy that we're talking about, let them be themselves, let them go out and figure it out on their own, let the TV raise them, it is spoken straight from the mouth of Satan. It is exactly the opposite of what the Bible wants you to see. Look at Proverbs chapter 24 and verse number 9. See, Satan relies on the fact that that foolishness would remain bound in your child, even as they go into adulthood. Look at Proverbs 24, verse number 9. The Bible says this. It says, the thought of foolishness is sin. You see, the Bible is saying that that foolishness, I mean, maybe you haven't read it this way before and you haven't connected this verse to Proverbs chapter 22, but the Bible here is saying is that that foolishness remains bound. That foolishness will lead to sin in their lives. I mean, just the thought of foolishness is sin. So it's, it's sinful to think a foolish thought, but that foolishness will actually get into their heart and it will come out in the actions that they do. That's what the Bible teaches. So folks, parents, if you think that they're by default good, you are training the foolishness to stay when you are supposed to train the foolishness to become unbound and to leave. So back to the point of the sermon this morning. The point of the sermon is enabling sin. This is where it begins with many people when their children are very young. These are the my child can do no wrong people. These are the, this is the mother who stands up, and I'm still at the young children, but this is the mother after some child has murdered many people or committed some horrible crime that stands up in the courtroom or talks to the reporters and says, he was always such a wonderful child. No, you enabled his sin. The foolishness stayed, and it turned into this wicked adult. The foolishness must be unbound. So look, don't be one of these people that thinks, oh, my child is the, is the smartest. Look, here's the signs of it. People that are constantly bragging about their child, my child's the smartest. They always want their child to be at the front of the line. You need to be kind of the kind of parent that teaches your kid when they're at a birthday party that you go to the back of the line and you let all the other kids get what they want first. Because you need to teach them to unbind that foolishness that in that case would be just pointing them to gratification of self. That my kids go to the back of the line. My kids are the last ones. You know what? You should understand, child, that it's important that the other children get something as well. Teach them to think about other people. That's unbinding that foolishness. And then when they throw a temper tantrum, and they're like, no, I want that, and this is that, and they throw a temper tantrum, they get a spanking. That's what the Bible is saying. The Bible is talking about, you know, the rod, reproof. It's talking about spanking your children. It's not talking about child abuse. It's talking about spanking your children so that foolishness gets unbound and they stop being that sinful, foolish creature that their selfish nature will want them to be. This parent is enabling sin that is just giving their child everything that that foolishness, that foolish desire of theirs wants. A child is given to you to train. A child is given to you to train, not to be an idol to you. Not for you to worship that child. A child is there to be trained by you. And as children get older, folks, the, this foolishness is going to get more and more and more serious. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And your, look, your enablement, if you enable them when they're four, you enable them with their five, you enable them when they're six, your enablement is going to have to get more serious and more serious and more serious and more serious. I mean, the problem is this, folks. The problem is this. Two things. First of all, sin spreads. Sin spreads and sin grows. This is the point of 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 9 through verse number 11, talking about how the, the church should be managed. Because sin spreads. Sin spreads and it gets worse and worse and worse if it is not dealt with. Look at verse number 9. It says, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. 
yet not altogether with fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. So it's talking about just how to deal with saved people in the church. It says, but now I've written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or idolater, or railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one, know not to eat. So the Bible here is saying amongst brethren, amongst saved brothers and sisters in Christ, you're not to allow these certain things to be inside the church house. If, you know, someone wants to become a member of the church and wants to come continue coming to the church, it's like these things need to be taken seriously because sin spreads. A little leaven, it says, leaveneth the whole lump. Turn to Proverbs chapter 22. Go back there. Go back to Proverbs chapter 22. And look at verse number 24. We're talking about enabling sin this morning and the consequences of it. In Proverbs chapter 22, verse number 24, the Bible says, Make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man thou shalt not go, lest thou learn his ways. You see what happens there? If you're hanging out, I mean, there's danger to you if you're enabling sin. If you're just hanging around sin and you're validating sin, you know what? The danger that 1 Corinthians 5 is talking about and Proverbs 22, 24 is talking about is that you could become involved in those sins as well. So there's literal danger to you personally. As a Christian, there's danger. But the main danger is this. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 5. The main danger is this. So you, there's danger to you, there's danger to the church, and there's danger to brothers and sisters in Christ that sin would spread. But the point I want to get you to understand this morning, if nothing else, is that it is not loving to enable sin. It is not loving for the person that is in sin. Because people don't want to call somebody out. They don't want to rebuke somebody for their sin because they think they're being nice to them. They think they're being tolerant to them. But the Bible actually says that you hate them if you do that. The Bible says that you are doing the opposite of loving them if you enable their sin. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse number 22. Lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partaker in other man's sins. Keep thyself pure. So the danger to you is that you become a partaker, that it would spread to you. But the main danger, folks, is to other people around you. The real problem with enabling sin, you say, I would never fall into those sins. I would never, I can hang around this person that drinks and does these things. I, I have no temptation to do those things. No problem. But you know what? The Bible also says that you are damaging that person. Because what you are doing by enabling sin, by supporting sin, is, what did I say at the beginning of the sermon? The Bible is a book of consequences. What you are doing is, is you are removing the consequences from them. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, there was somebody that was actually thrown out of the church, and the Bible says that the consequences that they are to face as they were put out of the church were to help them get right. Where so they could, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the very next letter, they were brought back in. They got right because they faced those consequences. Consequences are a way for God to get people right. And guess what? Romans 6.23, we use it every single day when we go out soul winning. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. You know what that is? That's consequences. So if you have somebody, and you think about this closely, if there's somebody in your life that is not saved and you are enabling their sin... It is very possible because what is the consequences of sin? What is that death that the Bible is talking about for the unsaved? That death is hell. The sin, the, the wages, what people have earned that are unsaved for their sin is in eternity in hell. It's real. It's what the Bible teaches. And by you removing those consequences from them, the first thing somebody needs to understand before they can get saved is that they're a sinner and they deserve to go to hell for their sin. Why would I, why would I need Jesus? Why would I need to be saved? Saved from what? If I don't think that I'm a sinner, if I don't think that I deserve this eternal damnation that the Bible clearly spells out, why would I need to stand in, why would I need Jesus at all? Saved from what? This is why we talk about the wages of sin. Because the wages of sin for somebody that is not saved is eternal punishment. 
You're going to stand in front of that? You're going to try to take, you're going to try to make the sin in somebody's life more tolerable for them? You're helping them to hell. You are helping them along to eternal damnation. Is that loving? That's why the Bible says, well, we'll get to it in a second, but look at Galatians chapter 6. Do not stand in front of God. The Bible is a book of consequences, and these consequences of sin are real on this earth and eternally. Look at Galatians chapter 6. Look at verse number 7. The Bible says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, shall he also reap. The real problem with enablers is they are removing the wages of sin. They are removing, not only are they in danger of sin themselves, of judgment themselves, as I've already showed you, but they're standing in front of the judgment of God. Who do you think you are? Is what I want to say to people that do that. To the unsaved, eternal judgment. But what about, what about enabling somebody that's saved? Well, they're saved. They're not, gonna, they're not in danger of hell. You know what? You're removing the consequences from them that God needs to use to get them right. Turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. An adult that refuses to leave sin is going to deal with consequences. Especially an adult that is saved that refuses to leave sin. They are going to deal with consequences in their life. Look, someone should have taught them this as a child, but if they didn't, and they're adult, and they're in sin, they're going to deal with consequences. Who are you to mask those consequences? We should have nothing to do with this as Christians. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. I'm sorry, folks, but consequences, that's the Bible. That is the Bible. That's the problem with our society today. There's no consequences for anything. That's why everything's getting worse. Why? Because there's no consequences. Because everybody's standing in the way of consequences. 2 Thessalonians 3, look at verse number 10. Here's one example. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you that if any would not work, then he should stand on a corner and we should give him money. If any should not work, neither should he eat. Amen. You know what that is? That's consequences. That's consequences. You know what? That should be there are a lot fewer people standing on a corner asking for money. If nobody gave them money because they're like, you know, if you don't work, you shouldn't eat. You say, oh, you know, what about the, you know what, the vast majority of the people I see out there standing today are young men under the age of 30 with two arms and two legs. They can get their tails out there and they can work or they should go hungry. That's the Bible. That's the Bible. You know what? You stand and you, you, you see some 29-year-old man on the corner and he's standing there with a sign, give me money, and you hand him five bucks, you hate that man. That's what the Bible teaches. He should get hungry and he should get to work. You know, hunger is one of the, is one of the strongest desires that a human being has. Like when you get hungry, it's just like forget about it. I mean, it, you can't even think straight you get really hungry. People get hungry, they'll get to work. Not eating. That's a big consequence. Look at verse number 11. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them that are which we, we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. They're not supposed to take money from somebody else. You're not supposed to give them a piece of pizza. A lot of people are like, oh, I, don't ever, I never give them money, but I'll give them a hamburger. You know how many stories I've heard of people walking up to somebody on the street and trying to give, oh, you, you really hungry? I'm hungry. Um, anything helps. And somebody gives them a hamburger and they throw it in their face. They throw it back at them. They say, no, I want money. Now they just have signs that say, there's a guy that stands out here about you know, half a mile away and he just says, cash, please. But they're just like right to the point now. But I mean, if you're not over 60, if you're not a widow of good report, these are and statements, by the way. If you're not a widow over the age of 60, if you're not a widow, look, you could be a widow over the age of 60 and not have a good report, and you're still not to be helped. A widow over 60 that is of good report, if, if that's not you, meaning all men 
get to work. Every male, oh, you're being sexist. You bet, the Bible is sexist. The, the Bible, men and women are different. They're to be treated different. If you're a man, it doesn't matter how old you are. If you're hungry, get to work. That's what the Bible says. Or go hungry. That's the consequences. Remove those consequences, you destroy the man. Nothing will destroy a man faster than handing him everything. If I wanted to ruin a person, I'd give him everything for free. And I'd destroy him. I'd destroy his life. I'd destroy his character. I'd destroy his family. I'd destroy his chances of ever getting right on anything. Just give him everything for free. This government hates people that does this to people. Consequences, that's God's motivation. Don't you get in, in, the, in front of that Amen. as a Christian today. This is a problem with our, our government. They just reward slothfulness. They reward drunkenness. They reward theft. They reward murder. They reward perversion. So what do you get? You get more of all of it. They reward everything that we talked about in Leviticus chapter 20. So what do you get? You get more of all of it. There's supposed to be consequences. There's supposed to be wages of sin. Remove all that, you just get more sin. It's not rocket surgery. That's it. I mean, the Bible's not complicated. It just doesn't fit the culture of today. Right. So you need to ask yourself today, with help that you're giving people, with help that you're giving people, ask yourself, am I masking consequences? With this help that I'm giving this person or that person, am I masking is Am I masking things that they have caused through sin in their life? Am I covering those things? If that's the case, you are hurting them. You are hurting people in that case. Go to Proverbs 13. Go to Proverbs 13. You know, the Bible says if you do this with your children, if you cover up your children's sins, look, I'm talking about your five-year-old. I'm talking about your three-year-old. I'm talking about your two-year-old. You know, two-year-olds can learn how to behave themselves. If you mask all of these things when your children are young, look at Proverbs 13, 24. The Bible says, he that spareth his rod hateth his son. But he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. You know what betimes means? It means early. It means when they're young. You got to get these things, you got to get this foolishness unbound early in their life. You know, the Bible says here, he that spareth his rod hateth his son. But you know what I've seen in my life is that people that just will not spank their child, people that will not punish their child, you know, what they, they, you know why they do it? They don't do it out of love for that child because the Bible clearly says that they do not love that child if that's what they're doing. You know what they're doing? They're doing it out of love for themselves. They're doing it out of, you know what, it hurts my feelings to spank my child. You know what, you need to become a man. You need to become a man in your life. You know, when I come home from work and I hadn't seen my kids all day long, you think I want to go and spank my kids? No, you know what I want to do? I want to go out and I want to hang out. I want to throw the ball around. I want to have Nerf Wars. I want to do all these fun things. But if I do that and my wife comes to me and says, here's the list of offenses that have happened today that I was not able to curb. They need to be spanked. And I say, you know what? I love myself too much. I think it's going to hurt my feelings to spank my child. First of all, as a man, you shouldn't be ruled by your emotions. That's why God gives a husband and a wife. You need to become a man and do what the Bible says, no matter how it makes you feel. You should not be ruled by how you feel. That's disgusting as a man. You should do what the Bible says and not be this selfish creature that just wants to make yourself feel as good as possible all the time. But you think that's what I wanted to do? No, but here's the beauty of spankings. It takes five seconds. All this other stuff that they implement today, time out and, and all these other things, and, and all the, it's just hours and hours and doesn't work anyway. Whereas, you know what? You go in and you say, well, here's what you did. And, um, you know, I don't really want to spank you, but you, you did this, right? Yep, did it, guilty, all that. You know, pass the punishment out. And you're like, okay, good. Um, you don't spank your kids in anger. It's just, it should just be something that has to be done because the Bible says you need to do it to unbind that foolishness. 
Get over yourself, do what the Bible says, and unbind that foolishness in their heart. And then guess what? Within two minutes, you're moving on, and then you are playing Nerf Wars. It's the same thing. That's why spanking is such a beautiful thing. If done properly, without anger, I'm not talking about harming children. But it is very biblical and should be done. And, you, and people that do it, they just they can't handle it themselves. They're, they're not able to get over themselves. But the point is, those people are not loving. Let's not redefine love. Let's keep the love of the love of the Bible here. Turn to Matthew chapter 7. I want to land the plane right here. The Bible says, Thou shalt beat us him with a rod, shall deliver his soul from hell. You know what's on the line with unbinding that foolishness from your child? Their salvation is on the line. Your child is not saved. There's going to be a point when they're six, seven, eight years old where they need to make that decision for themselves. They, they realize they're a sinner. They need to make that decision to trust on Jesus themselves. And if they don't want to have anything to do with what you say, if you're the parent of that article where they just won't listen to you, go show them the white ninja. Uh, then how, how are they going to listen to you when you try to teach them the gospel? How to, how to show them how to go to heaven? If they don't already don't want to have anything to do with what you say when they're seven. It is, it is salvation or not, folks. Everything's on the line. Everything. What's the point? What's the point of, of this sermon this morning? The point is there's this philosophy today, folks. There's this philosophy today, folks, that we should never call out sin. Don't judge. Someone just told me this a couple weeks ago, that we should never call out the sins of others. And I was like, I was biting my heart, my tongue so hard, it, I think it started bleeding. But it is a false doctrine that is taught. Many people use this verse to teach this doctrine. But look at verse number 1 of Matthew chapter 7. The Bible says, judge not that ye be not judged. See, never judge. Never judge anyone. That is not what that says. The Bible says, judge not that ye be not judged. What the Bible, what the King James Bible is saying, and he... It explains it. In the next few verses, we'll read it. But what it is saying is that don't judge people with a judgment that you are not willing to have put on yourself. Well, let's, let's read. I, don't take my word for it. Let's just keep reading. This is what people do. They teach false doctrine. They grab one verse. They grab one verse out of the Bible. They misquote the verse. Don't judge. That's not what that says. Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye? But considerest not the beam that is in thine eye. A mote is a tiny little sliver. So the Bible is saying, don't call out something that's in your brother's eye, some tiny mote that's in your brother's eye, when you've got a railroad tie in your eye. The Bible is saying, get yourself right. Get yourself right before you go call somebody else out because the judgment that you make on somebody else is going to be brought on you. It's going to be the same judgment that you have. You know what the Bible's teaching against here? Let's keep reading. It says, thou hypocrite. The Bible is teaching against being a hypocrite. Try to be a parent and be a hypocrite. You think there's a reason that God made children little hypocrite detectors? They're, hip they're hypocrite detectors. Like when they're four years old, they'll be like, but dad, I saw you doing that. Like, what? They're hypocrite detectors because God doesn't want you to be a hypocrite. So you go out and you live this life. I'll tell people this soul winning all the time. Here's where your works matter. You go out, you're saved now. You go out and live the life of a drunk and, you know, go out and just live this party lifestyle and then go try to open the Bible to your kids when they're eight years old. They're going to laugh in your face. That's what the Bible is saying here in Matthew chapter 7. It says, and how would it make sense to judge not if it means just have no judgment, which makes no sense at all, by the way. We'll go there in a second. When John chapter 7, I think verse number 24, literally says the words, judge righteous judgment. The Bible is just saying, be right about your judgment. I can't walk up to, you know, brother so-and-so and say, hey, think you got a drinking problem when I'm a drunk. That's what the Bible is saying. The Bible is saying, get the beam out of your eye so you can help your brother with the moat in his eye. That's what the Bible is saying. It's teaching against hypocrisy. Look, folks, this idea that we should never, I mean, you know what judgment means? Judgment literally means being able to tell evil from good. And this world is teaching, 
Christian churches today are teaching that you should not teach your children to judge. Of course, they're you know, it's Satan that wants your children to know, hey, don't know the difference between evil and good. Everything's okay. Don't judge. Don't have. They're literally teaching people to raise their kids to not have judgment today. But the Bible says judge righteous judgment. Don't be a hypocrite. And you know what, folks? That's loving. This philosophy today that we should never call out sin, we should never rebuke sin, we should cover up the consequences of sin, it is straight from hell. And it is not loving. Look, I, I, I once knew a man, and I'm not going to name any names, but I once knew a man that when he was a young man, everybody loved him. When he was a teenager, even into his 20s, he was the greatest person. Everybody loved him. His family all loved him. And then later on in his young adult life, he got into some very serious sins. He got into sins like alcoholism, fornication, many other things that I won't list here. He did not live much past 50. Is that loving? That people knew this man and nobody said anything to him about what was destroying his life? You say, was he saved? No. He wasn't saved. He's in hell. He's in hell, and nobody would stand up and rebuke him. That would have been the loving thing for someone to do. But you know what? There wasn't many people around him in his life who wouldn't have been hypocrites for rebuking him. There wasn't many people around him that had authority in his life that even were qualified to judge what was happening in his life. Guess who suffered for it? He did. It's not loving. Everybody around that man hated him. That's what the Bible says. Because they enabled everything that he was into and everything that he got into. And not only did it end his physical life on this earth early, but he never got saved. As far as I know, he never got saved. As a matter of fact, he was very anti-God in the last few years of his life. And there was nobody around him that loved him. Judgment, judgment with righteous judgment and not enabling sin is the most loving thing we can do for our brothers and sisters, especially our children. Everything is on the line. Otherwise, I mean, I would rather, I would much rather be seen, folks, as judgmental than somebody who would stand by and watch somebody that I have responsibility for destroy themselves. And I will never do it. Ask yourself, are these consequences from sin when you are helping people along? When you are co am I covering up what God is trying to do here? Ask yourself those questions today because if you are and you find that you are, you get out of the way of the Lord in that situation. Let's bow our heads and have a word.